Good evening. I'm Ned Sullivan, president of Scenic Hudson, and I want to welcome you to our Envision Summer Series. Three months of fun, informative, and what we hope will be inspiring virtual events focused on caring, community, and collaboration all around the Hudson River. This is where you can keep abreast of future presentations and even, even a rousing block party by visiting scenichudson.org. Tonight, we have an opportunity to get you up to speed on the status of General Electric's PCB contamination of the Hudson River. Scenic Hudson has been leading the fight with our partners for a comprehensive cleanup of these contaminants for more than 40 years. My own involvement in this battle spans almost as long and involves years at the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation heading up New York's Superfund program or the Statewide Hazardous Waste Cleanup Program. And despite progress that we've made, a 200 mile stretch of the Hudson River remains America's largest toxic waste site. Today, Scenic Hudson and our partners not only continue advocating for dredging of the upper river near the General Electric plant north of Troy in the Capital District where the pollution occurred decades ago, but also for developing and carrying out an effective plan for removing contamination along the 140 miles of the river below the Troy Dam all the way to New York Harbor. While there's been a modest reduction in fish contamination levels north of the dam, there has been no decrease, no improvement in fish contamination levels south of the dam where many families and people continue subsisting on the river's fish despite health advisories, health warnings against eating them. As we'll explore tonight, removing these chemicals is absolutely imperative from a social justice as well as a health standpoint. So it's my pleasure to welcome our guest tonight, John Bowermaster, who created a compelling film you're about to see, and Aaron Mayer, who's been a powerful and vocal partner in the PCB campaign for many, many years. Aaron is a member of the board of directors of the Sierra Club and served as the board's 57th and first African-American president from 2015 to 2017. Today, he chairs the organization's National Environmental Justice and Community Partnership Committee. He's a 30-year veteran of grassroots activism in the capital region where he lives. In Albany, he founded the Arbor Hill Environmental Justice Corporation and the W. Haywood Burns Environmental Education Center. And he helped lead the successful decade-long battle to shut down the solid waste incinerator that was polluting the Arbor Hill neighborhood. In addition, while he was at the Sierra Club, he played a critical role with Scenic Hudson and other partners in reaching the settlement that led to General Electric's commitment to the six-year dredging of the Hudson. Aaron was also a member of the White House Council on Environmental Quality from 1998 to, to the year 2000. Scenic Hudson has honored Aaron recently for his outstanding lifetime achievements by including him as one of the subjects in our People Who Make a Difference poster gallery. And if you haven't seen these compelling works, I urge you to visit our website. John Bowermaster is a good friend as well and a kayak buddy of mine and a renowned filmmaker. John is a six-time grantee of the National Geographic Expedition Council and one of the society's ocean heroes. He's written 11 books and articles for the New York Times Magazine, National Geographic, Condé Nast Traveler and Outside Magazine. He's traveled the globe from the Bering Sea to the French Polynesia to document in more than 30 films the complex interdependent relationship between people and the planet's fragile marine ecosystem. 
John serves uh, as chairman of the advisory board of adventurers and scientists for conservation. He's a visiting lecturer in the environmental and urban studies department at Bard College, and he hosts the Green Radio Hour with John Master, John Bowermaster on Radio Kingston. So last but not least, we are so grateful that John has collaborated with Scenic Hudson and our other regional partners to create Hudson Valley at Risk, a series of short engaging films providing insights on environmental challenges and opportunities facing the valley, which he calls the birthplace of the environmental movement. So this brings us to tonight's premiere of John's film, PCB's A Toxic Legacy. Over the last several months, we've had the opportunity to update and re-envision the film so even if you've seen a prior version, you'll see something very different tonight. So following the screening, John will lead Aaron and me in a discussion about the ongoing campaign. So I want all of you in our audience to feel free to send your questions through the Q&A feature. And now the film. New victories in General Electric's never-ending quest for better ways of living. Creating new comforts and conveniences undreamed of a generation ago. Men, money, machines, knowledge, vision, research. It is thrilling indeed to know that this is General Electric's contribution to the world of today and the better world of tomorrow. Man's mastery of his destiny. When I look out on the Hudson River, I see great, inspiring beauty. But I also see lost opportunity. The river still looks beautiful, but just below the surface, there's a toxic legacy. No one has done more to contribute to that legacy than General Electric. Today, we are dealing with the reality that GE has abandoned its responsibility for the river. GE has left us with a river polluted, contaminated, and changed for generations. For a 30-year period, General Electric dumped millions of pounds of PCBs into the Hudson River. In 1973, the Fort Edward Dam was removed from the Hudson, and all the PCBs that had come from two of General Electric's plants, one at Fort Edward, the other at Hudson Falls, and that had built up behind that dam were released into the lower Hudson River. And those have continued to flow downriver for the decades since. In 1975, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation said no more consumption of Hudson River fish. This ended a long-standing commercial fishing industry. We lost an entire culture, a way of life. In subsequent years, the Environmental Protection Agency made a determination that despite this contamination, that the technology didn't exist to clean it up. So they actually declared Notwithstanding that this is a federal Superfund site, we're going to say no action is called for.
The PCV contamination is a legacy that New Yorkers have had to live with for generations. And if you look at the new analysis, it shows that this could be a problem for the next 60 to 100 years. So it's more than a century of damage that we're talking about as a result of GE's actions. The Hudson River is a beautiful hazardous waste site, but it's highly contaminated with PCBs in the sediments, PCBs in the water, PCBs in the fish. And I think the evidence that PCBs have enormous and a great variety of health effects is just overwhelming. PCBs are known to be human carcinogens. There's been demonstration that people that live along the more contaminated part of the Hudson River have reduced memory function. And there is increasing evidence that the major route of exposure in those circumstances is from breathing the PCBs in the air. And the problem is that the other PCBs are spread over this 200 miles of the Hudson. And then remember that the Hudson drains into the Atlantic so we've contributed to the contamination of the Atlantic Ocean as well. In 89, they studied whether something else could be done to clean up the pollution. That study took place throughout the 90s. And in 2002, EPA determined that indeed, the, the correct remedy here would be to dredge or take out this PCB contaminated sediment from the Hudson and dispose of it safely. GE fought this every step of the way. They spent millions and millions of dollars on a PR campaign that went nationwide and was aimed at convincing people that it was best to leave the PCBs quietly sleeping on the bottom of the river. In 2002, the Environmental Protection Agency developed the cleanup plan for the Hudson that it ultimately imposed on, on General Electric. But in the subsequent couple of years, they conducted some 9,000 samples of the area where the cleanup was to take place. And they discovered that there was 200 to 300% more PCBs in the river than they knew about or acknowledged at the time that they developed the plan. Bad news is they never required GE to expand the cleanup. They didn't change the plan. And so we were left with much more contamination in the river than we'd ever expected. And that's why we're still fighting today. You have a very powerful juggernaut that has loads of scientists that was controlling, as they say, the flow and volume of science as to the efficacy of whether or not it was having an impact on humanity or whether it was a threat to uh, uh, human health. So as long as they had that edge, it was erring in their favor. But it was the minority anglers and fisher people that once we got involved into the argument in the mid 90s, it was active human use of the river for subsistence fishing that has been going on for generations, for decades, that everybody seemed to overlook. So right now you have a minimal cleanup in the upper Hudson. And so a lot of the contamination, basically from the Troy Dam and all the way down to New York Harbor is still here. While GE did clean up all of the contamination it was required to, far more was left behind. And a project like this that's about cleaning up contamination isn't about how much is removed, but about how much is left behind. And the Federal Natural Resource Trustees, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and NOAA have determined that the amount of contamination that's been left behind now after G is pulled out stakes, if they came in anywhere else in the country and saw these levels that still exist now today and put their eyes anew on them, they would be deemed a super fun site. And so that's what we're left with here in the Hudson River. 
In 2015, GE decided that the job was done. So they literally packed up the massive infrastructure that they had put in place of uh, cleanup technology, barges, uh, massive wastewater treatment plant, and they, they put it up for auction, they sold it. And the Environmental Protection Agency let them do it. They basically looked the other way and said, we, there's nothing we can do to stop this. So tonight we're here for the Hudson to fight against the continued contamination by General Electric PCBs. It's been contaminated for 50 years. EPA saying it's gonna be another 50 years before it gets cleaned up. And they want it to clean itself. They want mother nature to do the job. But we know that that's not gonna work. All right, what you might not know is the fish in Poughkeepsie show no response so far from the cleanup. So tonight, I want everybody to go in there and tell EPA, GE has to finish the job. We need to unite together and ask for a healthy Hudson. And we're here to fight and we're here to win. Hi, um, so my question is there, we know that fish tissue concentrations aren't declining here and further downstream. And we also know that the lower river isn't responding as anticipated to the remedy. So my question is, when will you issue an order for a full remedial investigation of the lower river? We're not there yet, but we are going to collect additional information and we do recognize and we, we wrote about it in the data. And yes, there are some slower fish recoveries uh, that we're seeing in the lower part of the lower river in particular. We have targets and goals for fish in our record of decision and in our plans. In about 15 years, we would be at a level where some people could eat one fish meal every two months. So the ultimate goal of the remedy in terms of fish consumption is one fish meal per week, which would be at some point greater than 55 years years and the modeling that was done uh, that led to the record of decision didn't even reach that 0.05 concentration within 70 years. So a century might be a right, right sort of order? Decades. Water. Clear. Clean water. Man's greatest need, his greatest friend. The river, because they left so much contamination in place, is not healing itself. General Electric has abandoned its responsibility to restore the Hudson River that it caused so much damage to. It has fought the cleanup at every step of the way and EPA has virtually conspired with them in allowing them to walk away from a failed cleanup. The people want to come out into the river, but they're still afraid to. They see the headlines, they know that it's gotten better, but it's not to a place yet where they really trust it. And we want to rebuild that trust. So we are looking at damages in the billions of dollars here in the Hudson River that the people are owed, and that those funds can be invested in restoring the Hudson in getting more cleanup, more PCBs out of the river. We will not rest until the river is cleaned up and restored for our children, our grandchildren, and generations to come.
Well, I can hear I can hear the video kind of fading out, so I guess that's the cue to uh, start the the follow up the Q and A. I you know we we made that film initially I believe in 2015 maybe and we went back and revised it this this past year because so much has gone on um, and you know selfishly I quite like that this version especially the that old that footage from the old uh, GE promotional films which I wish we could use more of actually because it's so indicting. Um, I'll, I'll start with Ned actually. Um, and if you do have a question, uh, just type it into the Q&A section and, and hopefully it'll make it my way uh, pretty quickly. Um, Ned, you know, Cinecunson has been very, very successful over its 50 plus years. Uh, you've had, you know, countless uh, successes, more, far more successes than failures, uh, incredible uh, legacy, et cetera. How hard is it for you to say that the Hudson River is America's largest toxic waste site. Well, John, it is very painful. And um, I think it inspires us to continue the fight. We, as I said at the end of the film, we are not gonna give up. And we're gonna use all available means to basically try to force General Electric through New York State and the federal uh, agencies who are the natural resource trustees to ultimately to, to get, get this river clean, cleaned up. And ultimately to compensate the people of New York, people of the Hudson Valley, the people of America and the world really for this incredible legacy of damage. 50 years to date, at least another 50 years beyond. You heard the EPA officials saying 50, 70, maybe 100 years. That's unacceptable. We must be able to find the means to get this job done so that it's safe for our generation, for our children, for our grandchildren. Uh, we can't sit on the sidelines and let a giant corporation that has basically uh, taken profits out of this river for, for decades and decades and left not only They've pulled up stakes. They've moved their, they've closed down the factories. They've, they're demolishing it. They've moved the jobs out of state. And yet they've been allowed to leave this toxic legacy. That's unacceptable. Yeah, we're in kind of this era, it seems, where um, more moral ambivalence is, is, is okay. And how can the, the board members at, at GE who have destroyed uh, the commercial fisheries of the Hudson River uh, continue with, with a clear conscience. I, I, I don't get that part. As combined with, I mean, how can individuals like you and all, everyone who works on this issue, how can you hang in there for 40, 50 years? And I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm most admiring in the work we do when we meet to these accidental environmentalists and purposeful uh, uh, environmentalists like yourself who work on these same issues, not just year after year, decade after decade. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't understand how the, the, the GE boardroom guys think, and, and, and I kind of don't understand how you guys think in terms of, I'm, I'm not giving up. Well, there's a couple of... This, well, go, I mean, Aaron, go. I, I think that, you know, first and foremost, board boardrooms and board members and shareholders, they think of one thing and one thing only, and that is the bottom line. Uh, you know, organizations like Scenic Hudson, Sierra Club, Riverkeeper, NRDC, West Harlem Environmental Action, and as well as a host of environmental justice communities up and down in Sloop Clearwater. Uh, we're the ones that are connected to the grassroots level uh, to our communities. Many of these environmental organizations like Scenic Hudson were founded to protect and preserve our natural heritage. I mean, at one point they wanted to raise off the top of Storm King and put a big dam up there so they can generate uh, electricity. We get Scenic Hudson, we get community pushback. It's always been the residents that have always pushed back against the boardroom, but it's an uneven field. You know, our democracy is shaped by corporates, corporations having cash, which is equal, equivalent to freedom of speech now. And we, you know, are really the voters, the people whose voices are not being heard. So it's a function of fundamental flaws in our democracy but also the way corporations are structured. Uh, you know, if you're relying upon a person to have a conscience and also make a buck, we can see that with our national government and what's happening globally, that uh, with regards to climate change, 
that, you know, humanity and ecosystems will always lose out to, you know, people's worship of the dollar and profits. Uh, we have to really dig deep and down in our hearts and, as they say, and come together. Uh, I think one of the most powerful things about the pushback is the diversity of the movement and the coalition that's been assembled, you know, thanks to Cindy Hudson's leadership. And I've worked with Ned for decades now. <laughs> Uh, and this river is the thing that comes through, but what unites and ties us all. Uh, and so I think that, you know, we really need to have a serious conversation, not only just how we need to act. Right now we're reacting because we're reacting to a, a, a crime that has been committed. But what we need to act is knowing our power and our voices and our votes to make sure that we're electing individuals who restore not only our democracy, but restore the environment. And so these things are intricately linked and we need to start to unite, you know, and come together and then strengthen that voice and that power to get the regulatory change and policy changes uh, retroactively if necessary so that we can bring about effect. We should not have to wait five decades or a hundred years to have a natural heritage resource that should benefit all humanity, but specifically New Yorkers within the Hudson River Valley. Yeah. And, and, and Ned, what, what is the, the latest in regard to the lawsuit by the governor and the attorney general of New York against the EPA? Do, has anything changed in the last six months or so? Well, it, the litigation moved very slowly and, and that's why we had hoped to get a favorable administrative decision. Uh, governor Cuomo and uh, the attorney general of New York state have filed a lawsuit challenging EPA's decision to grant GE a basically a get out of jail card. Basically, they said, You're, you've done the job, you've completed it, you've checked the boxes. Uh, and we, we had argued with our partners, Riverkeeper and others, that they had failed to achieve the, the minimal goals of any Superfund cleanup under federal law. And that was a cleanup that was protective of human health and the environment. As Aaron so eloquently says, you know, you can't eat the, the fish, the, the, the river is unsafe. How can EPA say that they've met that standard of a cleanup that is protective of the environment and public health? They can't. So Governor Cuomo uh, and uh, the Attorney General James has, have filed a lawsuit challenging that decision Sina Hudson, Natural Resource Defense Council, um, Riverkeeper uh, have joined that suit as uh, amicus uh, parties, and we're basically waiting for for action by by the the courts. And so the EPA gave uh, uh, GE a, a, they checked the box. They let GE off the hook for the moment. What what did, what would GE say today? I mean, if, if asked. Uh, what, what's their argument against coming back and cleaning up? Well, this is go ahead, Aaron. You go. Well, this is this is the, this is the devil in that detail. So when you have a settlement and a consent decree issued, uh, the corporation's bottom line is literally to the letter and to the dot and bullet points within that consent decree. So, for example, they had an estimation of what they had to clean up, and so the numbers that they agreed to. Uh, were based upon numerical estimates. So they, there was no wiggle room in that consent decree that would allow them, if more was discovered, they should clean up. And let's be clear, we're talking about the two major spots of corporate discharge where they made the big pools that led to the Cantam. We're not talking about anything south of the Troy Dam. So remember, we have a almost a 200 mile Superfund site with a river flowing over top of it. I always tell people it's not that you have a Superfund site, but you have a toxic Superfund site with a river flowing over top. So we know that the damage is consistent, persistent, and chronically putting people at risk. And so rather than coming up with a consent decree that is just and fair to humanity and the environment and the ecosystems, um, GE, and this is what the best lawyers that money can buy, uh, they're suing up on a technical point, uh, well, this is what we agreed to clean up and anything else, uh, you know, that's beyond the scope of what we agreed to, rather than what does the law say with regards to scientifically done, you know, defining what a cleanup is. And the science 
should have allowed for. The science dictates that you should do more. But unfortunately, and this is where the devil, you know, I always tell people, you know, you know, it's not Republican or Democrat, black, white, blue, green, because the environment doesn't know any color and the science doesn't know any color. But what does know color and what does pick winners and losers are politicians. And it's been a bipartisan screw up. Uh, this, 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 this mess, we can't sit here and say, well, this guy's good and this guy's bad. Basically, what we're seeing is what happens when our democracy is controlled and our judicial system is controlled by corporate polluting interest and Wall Street and shareholder value versus those of us who have to live with the legacy of what's left behind. I've grown up all my life living and swimming. I learned to swim in the Hudson. Uh, this is where my father taught me to fish and pass on the values of what was expected of me as a young man. I, you know, I grew up in the Hudson Highlands uh, and you know, the Hudson has always been a part of my heritage. And I absolutely have PCBs and my body fats uh, uh, along with my brother, Andy, Andy Mele and others who also live and ate fish from the Hudson. Um, there are numerous municipalities that pull their water supply from the Hudson. And for the state, the federal government, any part of our judicial branch to agree that a corporate polluter for the sake of protecting their shareholders can trade away the health, human health of New Yorkers is in, in New Jersey folks, is in and of itself a crime. And you know, what must we do now? See, one of the questions is that who can I donate money to beyond seeing the cuts? And listen, you know, I always tell folks. Get the biggest dog that's in the fight and invest in that legal, you know, uh, targeted donation to help with the legal fight. It's not just, you know, uh, uh, donations. We need you to be members and active within the environmental Hudson, um, environmental organizations along the Hudson River Valley. Uh, we want you to support environmental education programs like SLU Clearwater. That's actually working with schools to bring more people to educate them about the science. We need more citizen science along the Hudson. So there are portfolios within all the environmental organizations along the Hudson River Valley that you can connect with and should invest in. But that it's that grassroots activism that's actually got us here to where we are right now, but will also carry us to the logical conclusions of a successful fight and victory down the road. Ned, and Ned, maybe you can explain to us this natural resources damages phase because there, there, there is money out there that, that could be or should be going to residents, communities, river towns, et cetera. Yes, uh, John, the, uh, the next phase of the Superfund process is the natural resource damage phase. And, and that begins when EPA actually issues the uh, clean up the order to, to GE saying you've completed the job, certificate of completion. So they issued that so the natural resource damage uh, trustees, which includes the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and the US Fish and Wildlife Agency in Washington and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, they can then begin to bring pressure to bear on GE to pay for the 50 years of past damage and the 50 plus years of future damage that is acknowledged to be taking place. And the everybody re recalls the big uh, Gulf spill, the BP Gulf spill, deep water. And that was a, uh, a leaking uh, uh, oil, oil uh, dredging, uh, oil uh, drilling operation that contaminated the, the Gulf. New York's, uh, excuse me, the U.S.'s Gulf area. And that cleanup, which was short-lived and uh, the, the damage was extensive, but much more short-lived than what we're experiencing here in the Hudson, that resulted in a $9 billion natural resource damage claim. But that was BP putting up $9 billion that then was spread around the, the victims in the Gulf. So there, right. sh there should be not the equivalent of nine billion. There should be many, many more billions spent. Does GE even have the money? We believe that GE does have the money, and that this cleanup, this natural resource damage claim, should be in that ballpark because 
the damage has taken place over 50 years already, will last another 50 years. And the, it's much more uh, insinu insidious. It's in the river bottom, it's in the fish. It's, it's affected all sorts of wildlife. It's affecting humans. It's affecting drinking water. And uh, as Aaron uh, said, so this has got to be big and New York State, and those federal agencies, they've got to stand up and they're, they're moving pretty slowly. <laughs> they've, been not, they've been studying this for, you know, at least a decade. And um, we're hoping that in, in the months ahead, they're gonna be coming out with, with their proposal for damages in the, in the billions. And uh, we, will be, we will be publishing our own study about what we think the extent of, of the damage is and, and that work is going on right now. Yeah, and Aaron, I know, you know this is an issue of air pollution and water pollution, but I know one of your big concerns is, is that this is a, a, a people issue. This impacts a population who lives and depends on, on, the, on the river and having access to clean air and clean water. It is, and in fact, you know, there's a couple of questions as to why was the dam at Fort Edward removed? You know, a lot of anglers, you know, they, they try to restore the river to almost its natural conditions as much as possible. Dams block the migration of fish. Uh, anglers want full use of the river and they felt that uh, since they stopped dumping, removal of this dam uh, was one of those very myopic efforts to try to, you know, restore a water course. And that's why the dam at Fort Edward in 1973 was taken out. But, you know, this is one of those things where, you know, one great intention totally ignored the corporate use uh, and the discharges of PCBs. And they realized that when, after they took the dam out, uh, they released millions of pounds of PCBs that, you know, pour even more and, and flowed even more, you know, greatly downstream and really impacted the river. So it's one of those things where it was a so-called good government intent. Uh, um, uh, GE tried to fight the, you know, the, the destruction of the dam. It was an old derelict dam. Um, but the reality was, was that was even more sediments were released and, and let loose uh, the flow down river. It's not to say there weren't any there as part of the historic use, but that's why the dam uh, was removed. But that said, you know, even if the dam was in place, the point of the matter is, uh, it's a it's a perspective of the river. Is it a natural resource? Is it part of the heritage that we passed on in perpetuity for generation to generation, whereby all everybody enjoys in the natural wonders and boundary, bounties of the river? Um, do you come from a culture like a lot of African Americans and Hispanics or those who are Catholic, where fishing uh, is a part of their their food? culture, uh, their community culture, uh, angling is a way of life. Uh, so the river allowed for the continuity uh, through culture, custom, and heritage of communities to live and thrive independent. There are a lot of communities that, you know, people who, I'm not going to take food stamps because I got this massive river here. The river is bountiful. We have striped bass, we have shad, we have herring, uh, we have crabs. We have a lot of uh, flora and fauna here that people could depend upon. And why should one's culture, custom, or heritage put one now at risk because a corporation did not see this natural resource, but saw it as a, um, an externality that they could uh, use for their purpose and discard. But what they were discarding was the heritage of millions of New Yorkers who live within the Hudson River Valley going from uh, Fort Edward all the way down to the New York Harbor. And why should our cultural dependencies uh, put us in harm's way? And how do you repair that? How do you restore that? Uh, what are the mechanisms? And it's not enough to say, well, we're going to put up signs to tell you to stop fishing, or we're going to put up a sign to tell you that you can only have one fish a year. <laughs> you know, these are absurdities. And it's amazing how they take the average uh, New Yorker or average American nationwide and put throw their lives in turmoil for the benefits uh, and the bottom line of American corporations. It is as horrible as them riding off, them, off the, uh, the Gulf of Mexico with regards to the Mississippi 
uh, river, as well as uh, countless oil drilling and spills that are going into the Gulf. Um, you know, we can no longer tolerate it uh, uh, there as we would do here in our backyard. So the answer at the end of the day, uh, you know, we have to stand up, we have to speak up, we have to take aggressive grassroots action to restore something that not, is not a favor, but it is our right. We have a right to a clean environment. We have a right to clean water and we have a right to all of the bounties that that water and that heritage river provides. And it's not something to be begged for or barked away and no politician can write it off. And so this is part of us waking up and getting engaged in our democracy. And it's the most essential act of engagement that we can engage in right now. Yeah. Ned, someone, someone in the audience suggests that maybe the government should just pay, pay, get it cleaned up and then sue or demand a payback from the, the responsible parties. Yeah, I, I think that should be seriously considered. Uh, GE has made clear that they are going to fight this forever. And uh, so and litigation takes years and decades. So I think government action to get the job done and uh, then sue GE makes, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and this is a very practical question. It comes up all the time. As we know, there are about 100,000 people up and down the Hudson River who, take, who get their drinking water from the Hudson. Is there a relationship? Is there a connection between PCB contamination and, and your drinking water? I'm sure visitors to Rhinebeck would love, would love to know that, uh, that answer. <laughs> Well, it certainly is, is a concern and um, we are evaluating the impacts of PCBs on drinking water as part, as part of our evaluation of the natural resource damages. Uh, there are treatment plants along the Hudson, there are water supplies that have been taken offline because of PCBs in the upper, upper Hudson. Uh, there are uh, filtering systems that purportedly remove the PCBs from the drinking water uh, in, in the lower Hudson. One thing we always know about science, environmental science, is that as our detection becomes more and more uh, sophisticated and refined, we can, um, we've, and uh, our understanding of public health impacts, that smaller and smaller amounts of contaminants can cause uh, greater concern. So uh, Dr. Carpenter talked about the air quality impacts of breathe, you know, the breathing of uh, PCBs that are airborne. And um, I'm sure that someday there will be heightened concern about drinking water quality. So I think it's something that should bears intense scientific focus. And that, that I, I, I'm not saying it's unsafe to drink water from the Hudson, uh, Poughkeepsie, Rhinebeck, uh, other SOPAs, other towns are meeting dr drinking water standards with Hudson River water. Uh, but I think it, uh, it bears further scrutiny. And John, and, and just to add further, because uh, I think one of the things that the current uh, Washington administration shows us is that science is under attack. And if you uh, have corporate investment in our democracy that believes science is an evil and it costs them money, then they will put in executive branch agencies, whether state, uh, local, or at the federal level that can undo and damage uh, the scientific efforts to basically protect our human health and things like our drinking water. Um, it is absolutely, truly, to me, a crime uh, that you know, EPA is you know, out gutting its scientific department, its research. And right now we only can get the best science that we, the public through good governance can invest in. But if there is a political effort to undermine, subvert or fire the scientists, and it's not only just at the, at the federal level. Remember Dr. Uh, David Carpenter was doing pioneering work when he found that uh, PCBs were volatilizing and going into the air. Um, the executive branch administration that was in the state of New York at that time, a Republican one, removed him. They, 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 they really tried to damage him. Uh, and, and sadly, you know, some of the pioneering cutting edge science, science was put at risk, even right here within the state of New York. Part of vigilance of our democracy is know that it's all connected. 
Uh, so the protection of our drinking water to having the best scientists, we have to have good executive branches that are care about human health and the environment. And again, uh, we also have another issue with regards to judges. That's why they're stacking federal courts, because a lot of these courts that are going to be deciding these cases, if they perceive that the harm is to a corporation's bottom line and that outweighs the public health interest, you can absolutely have a lot of bad judicial uh, 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 rulings that actually toss out the protections for human health because the corporate bottom line or the corporate interest is at risk. Um, we are in a very interesting time and all the more reason that if we want the best scientists to make sure and science to make sure that our water is safe and uh, the drink or the air that we breathe is safe to breathe, uh, we really have to dig into our democracy and take that back. But right now, we are all at risk. We are all at risk and we should be deeply concerned. But that said, uh, the citizen efforts and the grassroots efforts by uh, Scenic Hudson, Riverkeeper, et cetera, they're there. But what they can do right now with the science that we have at hand is tell us that there's a point of heightened concern in activism. It's not something that will force GE or other polluters to the table to actively take action. That's where we need the largesse of our healthy democracy acting through our attorney generals at the state level and our federal ju attorney generals and justice department at the federal levels. So this is very, very, very serious. It's probably one of the most important consequential elections of your lifetime. And people should really care about your democracy because that's the laws and regulations of, that protect our health. People say, talk about too much red tape. Well, think of red tape as blood and lives lost because good science has been ignored or swept under the rug so that corporations can pollute, can pollute and destroy our ecosystems and put us all at risk. Well, and you know, these are very difficult times we're living through, but one kind of back, backhandedly weird, weirdly good sign is that environmental concerns are edging up the list of people's concerns. Uh, finally, I, I think if you asked most people for their top 10, uh, uh, concerns uh, uh, global warming, climate change would be near the top of the list. So we are slowly having an impact. Yeah, there are a number of questions that we've we've heard uh, on the Q and A. One is: Is it okay to kayak on the Hudson? And uh, it's John and I can be found out there kayaking uh, these days. Uh, I think probably. I've got, I've got all ten fingers. Yeah, I think. But the best, uh, the other issue that we'll, you know, continue to to try to tackle is is uh, wastewater treatment discharges into the Hudson, and uh, it's you know an equal disgrace that in 2020, we after storm events, we we still have um, we still have uh, raw sewage discharged in, into the Hudson. So it's best to stay off the river if you're going to capsize um, after big big storm events, but uh, otherwise you'll, you'll still find John and me out there uh, throughout the summer. Uh, somebody else asked, can we expect any further cleanup without a change of administration in Washington? I think the answer is clearly no. Uh, as Aaron very astutely said, this has been a, a bipartisan failure. Uh, both Democratic and Republican administrations have taken steps forward, but also failed us. And uh, so I, I think uh, if there is a change in Washington, and we've seen this administration, Trump administration, just nothing but hostile toward the environment, the rollback of a hundred uh, different uh, federal rules and policies, uh, but we are certainly going to be watching the election. And uh, if there is a change, we will be uh, right at the doorstep of the new administration, pushing both for regional administrators who are going to understand uh, the, the vitality, the importance of this issue, um, and at the, at the federal level in Washington, backing them up because we've had regional administrations under this uh, administration that uh, have failed us, but also under the prior administration that made the, the wrong decision. Uh, 
we only have a couple other questions. Uh, well, how does climate change play into this problem in the future? Um, that is such a big question, and that, you know, that begs the question of what's going to happen to the Hudson River as it, as it warms, et cetera. Is that going to have an impact on the sediment and the, on the river bottom? I think for that we need a we need a scientist uh, rather than uh, Ned, Aaron, or myself. Well, that's true, but I think anecdotally, I think that you know we're we're actually seeing it. I mean, we're seeing you know uh, things that are supposed to be 500 year, 200 year, and 500 year flooding events now increase with frequency, and with increased water vo volume that rains that are flowing into the Mohawk River Valley that flows into the Hudson up at uh, Cohoes Falls or even in the Adirondacks. We know that there will be increasing uh, le levels of water flowing through the Hudson. Uh, there are gonna be more frequent hurricane uh, events. In fact, they're talking about seawalls around lower Manhattan. Uh, you know, it, it's interesting uh, to see, you know, what the government is looking at with regards to uh, storm water and storm mitigation with regards to the effects of climate change. Um, you know, but the real, the real big issue, you know, right now is not looking at how levels will be rising. I just think right now, you know, we just have to begin thinking about, cause we don't want to say we got to worry about, you know, flooding versus cleaning up the water. No, we want to make sure the clean water act, which, uh, current administration, uh, is really trying to dismantle and pass the administrations, uh, totally ignored. And this Hudson River cleanup. Uh, settlement totally ignores the letter and spirit of the law when it comes to the Clean Water Act. So we really have to be concerned not only about the effects of anthropogenic climate change, but we want to make sure also that there's a regulatory framework that is still protective of our water bodies, our estuaries, and all source waters uh, that will be possibly increasing in volume, but as they increase, they should not be more contaminated. It is bad enough that we will probably have to deal with rising uh, water levels, but I think it's even worse that we have to then worry about those water levels transmitting and transporting contaminated soils and sediments onto our lands, our properties, and into our water supply systems. Hmm. Ned, final words? Well, building on what Aaron has said so uh, eloquently, this is about democ democracy. Uh, Scenic Hudson is credited with launching the modern environmental movement, but this remains a, a blemish on both the river and our democracy. And it's up to citizens to let Governor Cuomo know, let your state legislator know, let your Congress, congressional representative know that this issue matters to you because they're the ones that can take the action to force GE to do the right thing. It won't happen unless all government agencies and all stakeholders come together. As, as the head of New York Superfund program, I saw that GE took, took action, did the right thing when all parties came together. And Aaron and I saw that at the federal level uh, when the, the Bush administration uh, was pushed by New York State and our congressional delegation to force them to do a major cleanup of, of the Hudson. It wasn't enough, but we got them to take action and we can do it again. But it's gonna require people to stand up. It's gonna require them to vote in November and get the right people in office at every level of, of government. It's about our democracy. This is a major threat to it. It's a major threat to public health and the environment, and we've got to take take the river back. And for going forward, what should people do in regard to learning more about the PCB issue? There's a variety of stuff, I'm sure, at the Scenic Hudson's website. Aaron, I'll let you finish up. I, I, think, I think that there's a couple of things, and, I, and again, on to that democracy point. I think, number one, the most important thing is to organize. And, uh, and I think that, you know, people would say, well, do I want to be, you know, it's not about your party affiliation. I think it's your grassroots organization affiliation. I think some of the safest, since we're on topic about the Hudson and the environment, if you're not a part of the Sloop Clearwater, become a part of Sloop Clearwater. If you're not a part of Scenic Hudson and a regular contributor, become a part of Scenic Hudson. If you're not a part of the Sierra Club, become a part of the Sierra Club, become a part of Riverkeeper. Your grassroots democracy are as local as these organizations. It's more than just giving money, 
but even your volunteer, if you're a lawyer, if you're a scientist, if you're a public health professional, find ways or create new ways by which you can work through these organizations to expand our grassroots power to educate people about something as cherished as the Hudson River in our front yards or our backyards. But I think that it is through the universal equalizer of the environment and environmentalism and environmental movement that we can come together rather than putting on partisan hats, but putting on our eco hats. And I think through these organizations, the might of New York can be felt. Remember New York, I think as Andrew, Governor Andrew Cuomo said to Mitch McConnell, uh, when they're saying, let these, let these areas fail, he reminded him that the wealth of New York State and the power of New York State is what's really financing middle America. We're financing everything and we're financing even these corporations that are destroying our health and our environment. And it's now for us to turn that internally to protect our environment. And there's a gold old song that I'm gonna date myself, my boomer self by the, organ, the, the band uh, America called the Tin Man. Oz never gave nothing to the Tin Man that he didn't already have. We have the power to come together in New York. We have the power through these organizations the environmental movement, the activist environmental movement began in the Hudson River Valley, in the Hudson Highlands. Let us roar again. Let us come together and show our might. I want to thank you all for listening and being part of this. Ned, thank you for having me. And John, again, another powerful, beautiful uh, message on the Hudson. Let's keep this revolution going. I'm here for the long haul, born and raised, and I will continue to fight for this river. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, John, really inspiring. It's a pleasure and honor to work with you over these years and decades, and we'll, we'll all fight on together with support from everybody on this, uh, on this call today. Thank you. Thank you. I, I guess we're a wrap. Thanks, Aaron. <laughs>